I want to continue uh, tonight our series on God and government, and tonight I'll begin two or three weeks on, I think, one of the most serious subjects in the series, and I believe one of the most needed, and it, we're going to be teaching on the doctrine of the lesser magistrates. I might give a subtitle. What are Christians to do when political powers and civil governments make unjust laws or issue illegal mandates? Now, uh, I know John has this book, and I have been very blessed by it. Uh, a pastor I'll be referring to in the message, Matthew Truella, uh, The Doctrine of the Lesser Magistrates. I believe this is a word for such a time as this. I had heard about this doctrine, but never studied it, and I believe it was the timing of the Lord. I'll get to that in a few minutes, but first I need for those who have not been here uh, to lay a foundation once again about God and government, because it's all really about authority. Our foundational text has been Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, the messianic prophecy that says unto us, a a child is born unto us, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Referring to the coming Christ, now of course resurrected, the government on his shoulder refers not just to spiritual government, but all government. Albert Barnes said the sense of the passage is that he shall rule, that all governmental authority shall be vested in him. Now, if you weren't here last week, we talked about authority, that Jesus' ministry was a demonstration of the authority of the kingdom that he walked in on earth. He had authority, we showed you, to preach the word, heal the sick, cast out demons. He had authority to forgive sins, to command men, to de he demonstrated authority over nature, uh, calming the sea, speaking death to a tree, <laughs> over animals, over death. And after his resurrection, we showed you from the Great Commission something very important, easy to overlook, uh, in Matthew 28, 18, and he came and said to them, being his disciples, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And then he said, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Now, the authority that exists uh, with Jesus is different from all other authority. Only his authority, we've been trying to teach on the sovereignty of God, the fact that God is in control, and we've, just, we've been trying to lay a foundation that only his authority is total and final. Now, there are other authorities, but they are delegated and limited. Did you hear what I just said? All authority in heaven and earth is vested in Christ. So, all other authority is delegated by him, from him, and it's limited authority compared with his authority. Okay, you got that? Rush Dooney said, the power and authority of Christ is absolute and unrestricted. Men can only have delegated authority, subject entirely to God and his word. The Lord does not exempt from his jurisdiction any man, any state, nor any area. Now, we've shown you before 
that God has delegated authority in spheres in the earth. Uh, in the family, the father is designated as the head of the house. In the church, God has established authority in pastors and elders. And of course, in the civil governments of the world, we have presidents, or we have in some uh, places kings, not so much anymore, premiers, whatever. But the point is that civil government authority is from God, and it's one of the spheres of government besides the family and the church. But I want to take this next two or three weeks and focus on civil government authority and how it, the Christian relates to it. Now, if you know your Bible, and you've probably <laughs> heard this before, the go-to passage is Romans chapter 13, where the Apostle Paul says in verses 1 and 2, let every soul be subject or submitted to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. Did you get that? He just basically just said better than what I just said. There's no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. Now, I've taught this for years uh, as an encouragement to Christians to honor all authority because all authority is appointed by God, especially even civil authority, and uh, sometimes when it's not the best. Christians are here clearly commanded to be subject to authority, and I would say that is in the home, the church, and civil government. Since all authority is from God, we should, I'm, I'm laying a foundation where I want to go. Make no mistake, hear me clear, resisting or disobeying proper authority in any sphere of government is a serious matter. Parents are to be honored. Pastors and elders to be respected. And the laws of the land are to be obeyed. But, here's the big but. <laughs> We're going to talk about a big but here. What are we to do if a tyrannical civil government passes laws or make mandates that violate God's laws or take away our constitutional rights and freedoms? Is there ever any situation that warrants civil disobedience for Christians? Are there any circumstances where Bible-believing Christians are not bound to submit to the governing authorities? Not bound to obey. And I want to say and show you, hopefully, Holy Spirit helping me, the answer is yes. And the answer is found in a teaching practiced by the historical church in previous centuries. And it is known as the doctrine of the lesser magistrates. Now, relax. That may be intimidating. The Lord can make things simple, and I hope he does. Because this is a very, very important word for this hour in America, in the church. We need to recover the doctrine of the lesser magistrates. Now, what is a magistrate? Simply a civil authority or a judge who administers the law. 
Now, there are levels of, of authority among magistrates. Under that general definition, the president of the United States is a magistrate. The legislature uh, is, a ma is a magistrate. You come down to the state level, the governor is a magistrate. The mayor of the city is a magistrate. You can come all down to the justice of the peace that does marriages is a magistrate. So how many of you see there are layers or levels of authority? Now, we're looking at the doctrine of the lesser magistrates. And in his amazing book, Doctrine of the Lesser Magistrates, Pastor Matthew Truella says, a magistrate is a person clothed with power as a public civil officer, whether executive, legislative, or judicial. A lesser magistrate is one who possesses less power than a higher magistrate. For example, the mayor of a city possesses less authority than the governor of a state. Now, this doctrine was developed by a council of Protestant pastors in Magdeburg, Germany in 1550. And here's the story, the backstory of how it happened. The Roman Catholic tyrant emperor, Charles V, had branded Martin Luther as a heretic and ordered his arrest. In 1548, Charles made a law putting all Protestants under the rule of Rome. And every city in Europe complied and submitted except one, the city of Magdeburg, Germany. The emperor sent an army to besiege the city. And a group of pastors in the city formulated a statement that provided a scriptural basis for what Christians had a right and even a duty to do to resist and disobey civil authority. This document is known as the Magdeburg Confession, and it's important to Christians because it declares that Christians are to resist tyrannical authorities as ministers of Satan. This is from the Magdeburg Confession. The magistrate is an ordinance of God to be an honor to good works and a terror to evil works. However, when he begins to be a terror to good works and an honor to evil works, he does not the ordinance of God, but the ordinance of the devil. And he who resists such works does not resist the ordinance of God, but the ordinance of the devil. In other words, the Christians who inaugurated this doctrine or teaching held that tyrannical authority forfeits its rights to be obeyed. And the core of the Magdeburg Confession contained this statement, which became known as the doctrine of the lesser magistrates. Now, I'll be repeating this, and don't worry if you're, you know, please don't be into, sometimes I've found as a pastor in teaching the whole, that the, 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 the enemy wants to intimidate you and say, oh, this is going to be hard to understand, or, you know, it's not, I promise, it's not. The Holy Spirit's going to help us. But here's the statement, and boy, do we need this today. When the superior or higher civil authority makes an unjust or immoral law or decree, the lower or lesser magistrates have both a right and a duty to interpose and refuse obedience to the superior authority. And if needs be, openly resist their unjust or immoral law or decree. Now, again, notice we're talking about greater and lesser 
uh, magistrates within civil government. And there are, as we just said, different levels. The federal government is a higher authority than the state government. The state government is a higher authority than the city government. So this doctrine deals with situations where the higher authority makes an unjust law or decree. Now in the case I just mentioned in history, Charles V, who was a tyrant, uh, was the greater magistrate. He was in charge. He would be like the president or he would be like Putin in Russia or Xi in China. So he, he was the greater uh, magistrate. Uh, in our case, in America today, it would be the president of the United States. And in the case of Charles V, his decree was that Luther was a heretic and he wanted him burned at the stake, which was unlawful and wrong. In our case, I believe the vaccine mandates are an illegal and unconstitutional decree. And what the doctrine says that in those cases where the greater magistrate decrees or mandates or passes an immoral or unjust law any, or anything that contravenes the, the law of God, that the lesser magistrates are to interpose themselves in the situation, which means to place or insert between one thing and another. So in the case of uh, uh, the emperor, the higher magistrate made a law Luther to be arrested and burned as a heretic. The Magdeburg pastors the lesser magistrates. How many of you know these pastors had authority from God? But it was in a much smaller sphere, much smaller than the king or the emperors. But what the doctrine stated is that, and, and sh they demonstrated that these pastors in this city that were resisting the tyrannical decree from the higher magistrate interposed themselves between Charles and Luther and they protected Luther and this doctrine states that that is not only our right but it is our duty now let's just give you an example that brings it right home let's say uh, the president of the United States issues a mandate or decree that violates our constitutional rights. Now, based on what I just told you, who would be the first lesser magistrate or magistrates that should rise up to resist that? What level? The state. The governors of the individual states in a case like that are to rise up and say, no, no, because I've got jurisdiction here in the state, and I'm going to use it. I'm going to interpose myself between your decree and the people who elected me. If the governor of a state does not insert himself or interpose, where would the next level of authority be? the mayors of the local cities. Let's say the president's decree is immoral or, or unconstitutional and the governor, he agrees with the president, he won't do anything about it. Well, then the mayors could and should, from the Christian point of view, interpose. But let's say they don't. Let's say they don't. We saw this happen, didn't we? We just lived through all this. The president, most governors went along, most mayors went along. So where do you go? 
How about the church? Oh, I wish I could get this word to every American pastor. Sir, it is your, not only your right, but under God, it is your duty to resist. I'm not talking about guns and violence. Hope it doesn't ever come to that. But let me give you some examples. I need to move along. One of the most famous illustrations of the use of this doctrine happened before the doctrine even was formulated in the 1500s. It was in 1215 with the signing of the Magna Carta. You had a tyrannical king, King John, who had usurped the authority uh, to tax uh, he, he, would, he was a ruthless, terrible king. But in 1215, a number of the English barons and landowners and church officials, lesser magistrates, I mean, you know, those barons had authority over the lands that they controlled, and they were very powerful in their own sphere. Well, they came together with church officials. And they actually put so much pressure on King John that he signed a document called the Magna Carta, whereby the king reluctantly submitted himself to be accountable to English law. That's what the Magna Carta was. He was forced by the lesser... Mm, the greater magistrate was forced by the lesser magistrates to pronounce himself as equal under the law to everyone else. And that is how one of the world's greatest political documents was the result of the application of this doctrine of the lesser magistrates. 500 years later, America's founding fathers used the Magna Carta to guide them when they set up our constitution and government. Provisions of the Magna Carta gave the people the right of due process under the law, protection against unlawful search and seizure, freedom from taxation without representation, and the complete freedom and autonomy of the English church. All of those things were not existent until the lesser magistrates forced the higher magistrate to submit himself to the law of God and the laws of England. And America's founding fathers were well aware of all this. And it was their basis they used for their own rebellion and breaking away from King George of England. Because the Revolutionary War was a break with authority. And I don't have time to teach on all of the violations of God's law and even natural law that King George had perpetrated against the colonies. Taxation without representation was just one of them. How many of you know that most of the uh, colonists were Christians? And Christians know Romans 13, you submit to the governing authorities. And so they were submitted to the king until the king became so tyrannical and so oppressive that they got together and said, you know what, we're not going to put up with this. And if they had not taken this stand... America would not exist. And they used this doctrine of the lesser magistrates, the principles in it, to break away from England and give us America. Benjamin Franklin must have read the Magdeburg Confession because he said rebellion against tyrants is obedience to God. So, the Magna Carta saved England from tyranny. The pastors at Magdeburg 
probably saved the Protestant Reformation. And the principles of the doctrines of the doctrine of the lesser magistrates can save America today. I don't know if you just heard what I said, but this is very serious. Very serious. If they had killed Luther and brought the would-be Protestant, emerging Protestant movement under Rome, if that handful of pastors had not taken a courageous stand as the only city in Europe against the higher authority, there would be no Protestant Reformation. There wouldn't be an America. America's Christian patriots need to recover this doctrine today. We need to know that we have a biblical basis to resist. Because I hear Christians all the time, what can I do? What can I do? What can we do? Because we do feel overwhelmed. I mean, we got the, we got the executive, the legislative, the judicial, we got the media, and you, you, begin to, you begin to feel, whoa, I'm just a little old squeaky voice over here. I'm just trying, trying to <laughs> get along. But there is a biblical basis for it. A Scottish professor of theological ethics at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland, Alex Mason, says, the doctrine of the lesser magistrate is a unique Christian theory of resistance to authority which was first detailed in the Magdeburg Confession of 1550. This doctrine teaches that when a ruler has become an incorrigible tyrant, within a very limited set of criteria, he has abdicated his claim to legitimacy. He says, consequently, those magistrates with lesser authority under him may defy and resist the illegitimate magistrate and his unjust laws for the sake of protecting others. For the embattled Protestant Reformation, the Magdeburg Confession became the embodiment of a theology of resistance, allowing not only for a right to resist in certain circumstances, but a duty. Let me understand what I just said. We not only have a right to resist, when it gets to a certain point, God's people have a duty. I'll come back to that. And we have to remember, beloved, only God, only Jesus has ultimate authority. All other authority is limited, and they rule conditionally. Only Jesus has unconditional rule and reign. All earthly authorities reign under, on conditions. Read uh, more in Romans 13. Paul says, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Now, he's talking about the righteous government under God. Do you want to be unafraid of authority? Do what is good. You, won't, you will have praise of the same, for he is God's minister to you for good. Listen, watch that. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. He is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Now, here's the question. He says submit to the governing authorities, but he's laying out some conditions. The conditions for those that are in authority is that they are not a terror to good works. They must be God's minister to us for good. They must be an avenger that executes wrath on those who practice evil. Verses 5 and 6. Therefore, he says, you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. Uh, for this you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers continually to this very thing. Now, what Paul is saying here, he commands Christians clearly to obey authority, but he's saying the authority is not unconditional. Pastor Tuella says there are limitation clauses here. 
The scriptures are plain. The ruler's authority is not unlimited. The ruler's authority is not unlimited. The ruler's authority is not unlimited. He is to reward those who do good and punish those who do evil. Is that what they're doing today? No. They're rewarding those who do evil and punishing those who do good. But what if he begins to punish those who do good and reward those who do evil? He goes on. What if he makes laws, policies, or court rulings that reward those who do evil, uh, 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 evil and policies and laws or court rulings that punish those who do good? Should he still be obeyed? As we saw previously, the scriptures are clear. He should not be obeyed. In other words, tyrannical magistrates forfeit their authority. All right, let me come back down to earth and apply this to something we've been preaching in here for over two years. I warned you two years ago that the federal government's lockdown of Christian churches was unconstitutional and a violation of the personal freedoms of the people. Here is an actual slide from the sermon, May 15th, 2020. Government, remember that time? How many of you remember this? They were shutting down Christian church services. Pastors who continue to host meetings were arrested. Churches were warned that if public meetings were again permitted, they would have only be having limited to 25 people. Do you remember this? And if church services resume, notice, if they let church services resume, if they let, they allow, they permit church services to resume, strict social distancing will be required. I told you two years ago, I said, this is the camel's nose in the tent. You, you know, he's like the devil. You give him an inch, he thinks he's a ruler. And we stood still for it, and we did not resist. I mean, here and there, you had a brave pastor who would resist and speak up. Here and there, some went to jail. Some suffered huge fines for continuing to have services. And the sad part was a lot of Christians, good Christian people, said, well, what's wrong with those pastors? Don't they care about the safety of their people? You know, it's so easy to lose, if you're, if you're stupid, it's so easy to lose sight of the big picture. And you're over here, you know, guarding the hen house while the devil's hauling off your refrigerator. The First Amendment of the Constitution of the United States says Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. The federal government clearly violated the Constitution by prohibiting the free exercise of religion. They abridged our freedom of speech, our right to assemble. What should have happened? I'll tell you what, the duty of the individual states as lesser magistrates was to resist the authority of the federal government on behalf of the people. If the states fail to interpose, the duty would fall to the city governments. If the city governments failed to interpose, which they all did, then it was the duty of Christian pastors and individual Christians to resist. Two years ago, instead of resistance, we gave the government compliance. And a few months later, the same ones who closed our churches came out with the vaccine mandates. And we've got beloved friends. When her father dies in Hawaii, they can't go to the funeral because they haven't had the shots. You think that's not devilish? The question for committed Christians should be, do we have a scriptural basis for disobeying higher magistrates? The answer is yes. 
I got too much here. Let me give you some examples because it's important. I mean, how many of you know we got to have Bible for that? We can't just have, well, a group of pastors in Germany came up with this idea we need to resist and this all sounds okay, but where's the Bible? Let me give you some Bible. I'll give you two or three. The Hebrew midwives. Who was the higher magistrate in Egypt? Pharaoh. What did Pharaoh do? He was afraid of the coming promised one, and he said he sent out a decree to kill all the Hebrew children under the age, males under the age of two. That was the edict. But the Hebrew midwives, the women who went into the homes to deliver the Hebrew babies, the Bible says in Exodus 117, but the midwives feared God. And did not do as the king of Egypt commanded. But they let the male children live. These brave women interposed themselves between Pharaoh's decree and the innocent children. And they got called in for it. And then they told the king a lie. They said, well, we can't, you know, we, we can't help it. These women deliver so quick. By the time we get there, the baby's already born and, and gotten hid. But you know what? God doesn't seem to mind they lied. Because in Exodus 120, it says, because they did this, God was kind to the midwives. And the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. So we see here a clear case of disobedience to authority, civil authority, that was not only appropriate, but God blessed it. Over in the book of Daniel, the three Hebrew children were told that they had to worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up of himself. It was a command, it was a decree. And it carried a threat. When you hear the music, everybody bows down. If you don't, fiery furnace. These three young Hebrew boys refused to obey. They told the king when they were called up before him in Daniel 3, 17, 18, our God is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not... Even if, even if he doesn't, let it be known to you, we will not serve your gods, nor will we worship the golden image you have set up. This is a direct refusal of a mandate of a higher magistrate, and it put them in peril. But what happened? You know the story. They were delivered out of the fiery furnace. The king was, the king was just awed. And he ends up worshiping God. And he even says, nobody can speak against this God from now on. Why? Just because three young men were able to operate as lesser magistrates. And by the way, they were magistrates. They were, they were all officials under the Babylonian king. A few years later, we see king, a different king, Darius, issue another law designed by the king's counselors in a plot to destroy the prophet Daniel. It says in Daniel 6, 7, and 8 that all the governors of the kingdom, listen, do you see magistrates now in this? All the governors, watch, the administrators, the satraps, the counselors and advisors have consulted together to establish a royal law or statute to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now sign the writing so it cannot be changed. And the king signed the decree. But Daniel heard about it, and he resisted. The Bible says he continued to pray to God three times a day, opening his window so everybody could see he was praying to God just as he had done before. And you know what happened. You see, here's the thing, you gotta, and here's where Christians get, get, get yellow. What you say, well, Pastor Ray, if we, we resist, it's going to cost us. 
He could. But here, so he threw you in a fiery furnace. If, how many of you know if you're in there with God, you're okay? And here, the lions didn't eat Daniel. And Daniel, in the morning, they, they said, you're alive. And Daniel said, in 622, my God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, king, I have done no wrong before you. And the king was so impressed, he made another decree. In 626, he said, I, Darius, make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall endure to the end. Notice the pattern. An evil magistrate passes uh, an immoral decree, command, law that contravenes the word of God or a righteous constitution. The lesser magistrates take a stand against it. They are put to the test. But they come out on the other side delivered and God gets glory and ends up changing the hearts of the greater magistrates. I mean, that's what happened here. That's in every case. It makes you wonder what would happen if the American church would resist authority and rise up together to disobey the unlawful commands and mandates that are coming down. What would happen? All right. Are you still breathing? All right, let me try to land this plane. God has given all authority to Christ. Therefore, all other authority is delegated and limited. John Knox, the great Scottish reformer, said, True it is that God has commanded kings to be obeyed, but likewise true it is that in things which kings commit against his glory, God has commanded no obedience. You know, I didn't even know about this doctrine back when I started preaching. Actually, I didn't know much about anything back in the early 80s. And uh, I preached a couple of times. And, you know, I, you know me, I just, I'm the same now as I was then. I preach on anything. Politics, it needed to be preached on. And I had uh, uh, well-meaning people come to me after a sermon and say, Pastor Ray, you know, we're just kind of a new church here. Maybe nobody told you, but... Have you ever heard of the Johnson Amendment? I said, mm, I maybe a little bit. President Johnson, you know, the Johnson Amendment. And uh, that, was a, that was a 1954 amendment to the tax code that threatened churches that speak out on politics with the loss of their tax exemption benefits. So these well-meaning people, here I am, a young pastor. They said, well, you know, he's kind of young and stupid. He doesn't know... We could lose our tax. We could lose our tax standing, and if we lose our tax, if if the government hears Pastor Ray's message on politics and they don't like it, man, they can come in here and take away our exemption, and then the people's giving they wouldn't get a they wouldn't get a tax credit for it, and uh, well, man, the church what's going to happen? The church would be out of business, and you know, I I told him I said I'll pray about it, but I don't think I care. Honestly, I said, you know, it was almost like, so what am I supposed to do? So now I'm going to submit to some stupid law. By the way, that Lyndon Johnson was a, was a tyrant. And he, uh, you know why the amendment came? He had a feud with some Texas pastors. And he wanted to get back at them. That's how petty that whole thing, the basis for that was all about a little feud that he had personally. So he put the whole country's churches under this threat. Well, I don't know about you, but I just can't, I can't change. And we're still here. We still have our tax exemption for now. But if you take it, I, what are you going to do? Are you going to submit to that rule? Oh. Now, I was raised to honor authority, and I've always tried to live up to my training. I believe honoring authority honors God until it doesn't. There are limits to all authority except God's authority. 
How many of you know Canada has become a police state? I mean, it is literally a police state. More on that later. Pastor Jacob Rome, Trinity Chapel in Ontario, Canada. Just because someone in authority is in authority does not mean they have absolute authority. There are limits to it. And when a higher authority commands a lower authority to do evil, it is the duty of the less authority to resist the higher authority. Here's another thing. I don't know, maybe I'm old, I don't know. But I'd like to hear a little more in American churches about duty. You know, you hear a lot about rights. You know, a lot of what's going on is about rights. But what about duty? Duty is that which one person owes to another or by which a person is joined to another. Duty is any action required by one's position required by one's position or by moral or lawful considerations. I mean, we were a lot about rights, little about duty. I just say this to my fellow pastors, my brothers and sisters in Christ. We not only have a right to resist this kind of evil authority, we have a duty to do it. I'll repeat it one more time. The doctrine of the lesser magistrates. When the superior civil, higher civil authority makes an unjust or immoral law or decree, the lower or lesser magistrates have both a right and duty to interpose and refuse obedience to the superior authority and if needs be openly resist their unjust or immoral law or decree. Let it be known, if not before, where we stand on this matter in this church, and with God's help, we will stand. We will stand. It, it's already, I've already decided. I hear the threats. I realize it may cost us as individuals, churches, but every one of us now needs to make up our mind, where are we gonna go? Where are we gonna be on this? Are we gonna just comply? And by the way, I comply everywhere I can. I drive the speed limit, I pay my taxes, but there's a place where it crosses the line, beloved. And we have seen our higher magistrates cross the line. And we better be resolved. And all I'm trying to do is give you a biblical basis for what to do and how you should see this and what God is calling us to do. And here's the last word, Pastor Torella. I love this. Divine law trumps human laws. When the state commands what God forbids or forbids what God commands, men have a duty to obey God rather than men. Amen. I can't say that any better. Father, I pray in Jesus' name, that we will ask for the old paths as your people. That we'll have the wisdom to look back and see how other brothers and sisters handled similar situations to what we are going through today. That we will have the wisdom to learn from our faithful forefathers who had to go through these kinds of tests and trials and came through passing the test with flying colors. Pray that would be our testimony in the American church. With your help and grace, in Jesus' name, amen.